thanks to you all. Thanks for MAPS for hosting this conference again, and thanks to BIA for organizing the track and inviting me to participate. I want to talk about a couple of subjects that have been of great interest to me, one for a much longer time and the other much more recently. Uh, they have interesting commonalities. Um, first, I have to confess that I'm not an expert really in neither. The, the real experts in ayahuasca are the uh, leaders in places like South America where uh, you know these practices are indigenous and have a long, long history. I, I've had experiences with ayahuasca, but I'm certainly no expert other than having read a lot about it as well. Um, and with respect to uh, economics, I've never taken an econ economics course in my life. I uh, used to be completely bored, silly by the topic uh, generally, and just in the past couple of years have actually become fascinated by it. So I'm going to share with you some of what I've been exploring in that area. Uh, and interestingly, some of these issues that I'm going to discuss came up on Thursday night at the Ayahuasca Community Forum uh, around the commodification of ayahuasca. So, Many of the ways to think about ayahuasca have been discussed already at this track. So it's a, a vine, obviously, the, the brew itself. It's a plant teacher, a medicine, a sacrament, uh, a drug of abuse by international control definitions. But I'm going to talk about it uh, as a cognitive tool and more importantly as a global commodity, which it's obviously emerging as in many respects. So a bit about economics. It, is a term that derives from the Greek words ekos meaning house and nomos meaning law or rules. Uh, it's developed formally as a scientific discipline or social scientific discipline in the 18th century uh, called the queen of the social sciences or the dismal science. Uh, its unit of measurement is money which is a fascinating concept as well because it functions as a medium of exchange, a store of value and a unit of account. And it's interesting that economies also cognate with the word ecology, and there seems to be, in my estimation, a, a divorce from those two concepts, uh, much in the way as astrology and astronomy have been divorced, also with common roots. Uh, so with respect to the globalization of ayahuasca, uh, I've written a bit about this, but I was focused on the cultural aspects and sort of oblivious to the terms globalization actually com coming out of the economics and uh, commodification issues of the global financial system. So ayahuasca is just one in a long list of commodified plants uh, in the history of colonial and colonialism and empire. Tobacco is probably the best example of a, a sacred plant that was taken out of its cultural context and turned into something quite harmful uh, and we're still living with that in terms of global burden of disease. Tobacco is right up there uh, with alcohol Opium, obviously, uh, was a huge driver for the empire, and I think it was the largest source of revenue for the British East India Company. Uh, and sugarcane, molasses, which were used to produce rum. These were really, you know, the, the colonial enterprise was originally focused on gold and silver, but the real economic success stories were based around the use of like, the export or the uh, production distribution of, of these plants internationally. The, the most interesting ones I find are actually what I call xanthinated beverages. Uh, coffee, tea, and cacao, or coffee, tea, and, cho and chocolate, uh, which were all new psychoactive drugs into Europe uh, in the 17th century. Uh, London's a good example. In 1650, there were zero coffee houses, and by, the, by 1700, there were hundreds of coffee houses. And these were new social spaces, spaces uh, where institutions of modernity were flowering in. So the first natural philosophers or scientists were the patrons of these new, new types of spaces where they came and discussed their new ideas and gave public demonstrations about their, their uh, new findings. The first mass media or newspapers were d disseminated and read and dis discussed at coffee houses. The first stock trading and insurance companies uh, were taking place, uh, were, were happening in coffee houses. So Lloyd's of London, which is one of the world's biggest insurance companies, was originally Lloyd's Coffee House in London. And it was interesting that these were also contrasting social spaces with what was previously the only real social gathering place, or the t tavern or the alehouse, where obviously alcohol was the primary uh, drug of consumption. And those were associated with licentious behavior, uh, unruly behavior. And the norms of civility and sobriety that emerged around the coffee house and emerged in the, in the growing uh, public sphere uh, that came out of that. Uh, Jürgen Habermas talks a lot about that, or wrote about this in his uh, first book, The Social Structure, or The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. Uh, 
uh, I would argue that the constructs of sobriety and inebriety uh, that we now sort of have as the basis of our modern drug control and, and perspectives on psychoactive substances emerged not as a contrast between alcohol and water, but between alcohol and these xanthinated beverages. And so by 1720, when the gin craze hit London, uh, it was a, sort of the first public drug scare uh, and first government reaction to, to drugs. Uh, well, there had been some reaction against tobacco, but it was a really a good example of uh, how these contrasting norms of sobriety and inebriety emerged. And th this has led to the global uh, drug control regime, ultimately. There's a long history that I won't go into here. Uh, but the International Narcotics Control Board is the sort of culmination of that in many respects, which is the quasi-judiciary body of the United Nations that's uh, responsible for implementing or for ensuring compliance with the international conventions that um, Kevin was just talking about. So in 2010, in its, uh, in its annual report, the INCB su uh, suggested that governments need to look at controlling substances that aren't within its purview, uh, one of which was ayahuasca, and they talked about the a growing use and abuse of these kinds of plants, making no distinguish between use and abuse. And of course, by definition of the treaties, any non-medical or non-scientific use is by, by definition abuse. Uh, and by the logic of the drug control regime, uh, the shaman or church leader who pours ayahuasca in a ceremonial context is trafficking. So when the INCB talks about controlling, of course, it's interesting to think about what that invokes right away. The international trade standards, uh, you know, if, if we were to follow that logic, would there be some kind of international standards imposed on the production of ayahuasca? Uh, the idea of uh, the gross domestic product and patents and intellectual property, industrial production, I mean, the, the patenting of ayahuasca already took place uh, in uh, the United States, or at least the patenting of a Banisteriopsis capi vine, 1984. Uh, that was actually fought and rescinded, uh, but then ultimately reinstated. Uh, so there, there's still sort of a legal area and the possibility of genetic engineering of these kinds of plants and creating a new sort of patent structure around that is a real possibility. And you can envision a derivatives market on B. Capi and P. Viridis futures uh, coming out of this. So when, when we talk about control by the international drug control definitions, this is what we're potentially looking at. And, and it raises the real questions around sustainability uh, of the development of a growing market for ayahuasca. You know, it seems that the demand is increasing, partly through venues like this, uh, and so will supply be able to keep up with that demand? Uh, and there's a certain um, impetus towards the authentic uh, ayahuasca, even though there's various kinds of alternative anahuasca brews or pharmahuasca preparations that could potentially give the same psychoactive effect. Uh, many people seem drawn to the traditional, as I say, authentic kinds of brews. So the issue of commodification came up for me in discussions with a colleague uh, who was a First Nations, Canadian First Nations woman, who was challenging me to think about uh, how is this profaning a, a sacred substance when uh, there's uh, ceremonies are being held uh, for considerable sums of money to participate, hundreds of dollars a night often. And she was asking me, you know, how is this different from going to a 3D movie or going to Disney World? You know, it's, it fits very well with the Western consumerist paradigm. You pay your money, you, you get your experience, and everybody goes home happy. And there's people making considerable sums of money potentially off this, uh, depending on their intention, uh, potentially just for profit. Although I think, with, as with any kind of profession, there's multiple reasons why people get into it. Um, the practice of medicine is a good example where people can be both motivated by uh, personal gain and by wanting to help others. But the, the challenge of uh, the, the commodification of it, she put to me also, is you know, in, in her cultural traditions, there's always a reciprocity between somebody providing a ceremony and somebody attending one. Um, that traditionally somebody will bring a bundle of corn or a bundle of, bundle of tobacco or a chicken and offer something in, in exchange. And I was reflecting on that and, and, and thinking, okay, well, I feel like I'm getting something of benefit here and I want to offer something of value in return. And it's interesting that ayahuasca, the experience itself, often feels like a, a gift. In fact, the word daime in Santa Daime is derived from the Portuguese uh, term give me. So, I'm both getting something of value from the plant itself and getting something of value from the people who are providing the ceremonial context in which I'm using it. And what can I offer in return? I was reflecting, the problem isn't the reciprocity, 
it seems to me that the problem is that the only universal medium of exchange in the modern world is money. And so I started doing some, some research on the history of money. And I was dr drawn to, well, I'm going to go into the, the idea of cognitive tools now, and I'll come back to the question of money. So as I, say, I wanted to talk both about ayahuasca as a global commodity and as a cognitive tool. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, the term cognitive tool I use as a heuristic device to sort of think about how ayahuasca can be, uh, can help explain uh, the value of, of learning, of the non-medical benefits potentially, uh, the kinds of cognitive benefits for the better than well approach that Bob Jesse talked about uh, on, on Friday morning. So the cognitive tool concepts uh, I have learned about through the Soviet psychologist Lev Vygotsky who developed what he called an extended theory of mind. Cognitive tool use has an important effect on the internal and functional relationships within the human brain. Uh, his cognitive, Vygotsky's concept of cognitive tools suggests that not only our minds, but also our brains and our neural architectures are shaped by our uses of tools. So examples of t cognitive tools that he used primordially was literacy, numeracy, maps, mnemonic techniques, and then also scientific instruments, the abacus, computers, the internet, and I would submit also psychoactive substances. And the, the idea of the tool is, is really um, illustrated well by thinking of a knife in the hands of a skilled surgeon uh, or a master chef, a knife can create miracles, but in the hands of a child who thinks it's a toy, it can be, pot be potentially dangerous. And I think the same thing could be said of something like ayahuasca. So cognitive tools are means of symbolic and or cultural mediation between the mind and our world. And so I would argue that certain forms of knowledge or understanding may be predicated on our facility with particular kinds of cognitive tools. So this invokes concepts of epistemology and alternate ways of knowing. So it may be that ayahuasca and other entheogens are tools for empirical investigation of consciousness, but also perhaps eco ecology and a relationship with our surroundings. So I'm just going to go through a brief evolution of cognitive tools that I think are important to uh, understanding our current economic situation and what ayahuasca might be able to teach us about it. So Vygotsky argued that literacy and numeracy were primordial cognitive tools, but I think more importantly even as seeds, the advent of agriculture shift human, shifted human cognition, cognition with respect to time, the future, and nature. It also fundamentally transformed social organization, power, and economics. So the domestication of plants and animals that happened around 10,000 BCE uh, it shifted us from hunter-gatherers to proto-urbanization. It set up the first hierarchical societies where new kinds of people came into existence uh, who weren't involved in the direct production of, and, or acquisition of food. So groups like priests and bureaucrats. It's notable to note that the, the, the words culture and cultivate have a common etymological origin. And it would also invoke the alienation of humans from environment or nature. And it was in the inauguration of private property and debt. And debt's an interesting concept in relation to a monetary system, system as I'm going to get to. Numeracy and literacy, uh, re reading and writing, are natu not natural to human beings, like our oral language or spoken language, but must be taught as a kind of techno technological innovation. And it's only been around for about 5,000 years. Um, but they were a revolutionary cognitive tool, and as I say, it does, it does help shape our neural architecture, compare uh, a literate brain to a non-literate brain. There's actual neural architectural differences. Pre predating uh, numeracy were tally sticks, uh, which were early forms of tracking debt. As I say, I want to get back to that concept. Uh, and then them sort of building a, a layers of cognitive tools upon others. So the next innovation that I think is really important is the in, uh, introduction of the Arabic numerals, zero through nine, which were invented in India around 600 AD, but introduced to Europe in the late Middle Ages, replacing no Roman numerals. And this allowed for new forms of uh, arithmetic, mathematics, things like algebra, calculus, statistics, and accounting became possible. Uh, they really weren't uh, done prior to that in basic pebble counters or the abacus was used uh, and then written down in Roman numerals. But the zero through nine uh, decimal system created the possibility of double entry bookkeeping, which was another critical innovation as a kind of cognitive tool invented in Venice in the 15th century. It allowed for economic transactions to be simultaneously represented as credit and as debt. 
It revolutionized commercial activity as well as natural philosophy, which was implicated in the creation of the epistemic unit of the modern fact. Uh, there's one of my references down here talks about the importance of double ep entry bookkeeping as an epistemological uh, revolution uh, that was sort of the advent of modern science. So it's ultimately led to the macroeconomic, macroeconomic measures of gross domestic product to account for economic health. It's also led ultimately to major accounting scandals such as Enron, WorldCom, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and MF Global. The scientific method uh, took the concept of natural philosophy as it was originally called, applying a clockwork or me mechanistic model of the universe. It allowed us the illusion of human control over the natural world. Its application in medicine has resulted in mortality control and only much later in birth control, which has led to an explosion in the human population uh, that many would say has already exceeded the carrying capacity of the earth. Its application in geochemistry has resulted in rapid exploitation of petroleum energy and uh, resources in the 20th century. The past 150 years or so, uh, our economic system has been predicated on cheap energy inputs through petroleum resources. And its application in economics has resulted in so-called risk management through complex, complex financial engineering formulas, things like collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and the like. So today, Virtually all money, this is, this is what was astounding to me when I started doing the research in, into the history of money. It's not the concept of money in and of itself, it's the, the form of money that we all take for granted. Uh, I used to believe that the, the pieces of paper that I carried around in my pocket were symbols of value, but nothing could actually be further from the truth. Most money that is in existence in the world today never gets put into paper and coins. It's zeros and ones, binary bits, but originally it was sort of the double entry bookkeeping ledger system. Uh, where new money is created by private banks by conjuring, conjuring it into existence in the form of loans. Uh, what, is invent what is created is only the principle. Uh, it's the fractional reserve lending concept. And the ob obligatory interest that has to be paid on it comes back out of the same pool, which ultimately is a flawed system. Uh, it can't be sustained. Uh, defor default and foreclosure are inevitably part of the system, and it allows for the trickle up that we see uh, it results in a growing inequitable distribution of wealth between the poor and the rich, and arguably, arguably the biggest gap in uh, that distribution is not between the poor and the rich, but between the rich and the super rich, between the super rich and the super duper rich. That's where the biggest wealth discrepancies are uh, arising today. And the mathematics of compounding interest creates a need for exponential economic growth. just uh, showing an exponential curve on the credit market debt of the United States over the last 50 years or so. It's kind of flatlined a little bit, but it's still growing slowly in the last five years. Uh, but the 2008 crisis, the response to it, which arguably, uh, you know, the, the, the roots of it were too much debt, the response has been to add more debt. So this brings me back to what, how does this relate back to ayahuasca? Well, my question is what, what can, uh, the, what is the value of the ayahuasca experience? Can it really be represented in the unit of money as it's currently defined? How do we create a means of exchange that allows for genuine reciprocity of value? Can ayahuasca help stimulate a cognitive shift to reestablish a link between economy and ecology? I, I don't have any answers to these questions, but I think it behooves us all to think about them really deeply and to think about how our monetary system is actually uh, implicated in the kinds of uh, uh, lifestyles that we in the first world tremendously benefit from, but people living in the jungles of the Amazon uh, are not participating in and are very unlikely to unless something drastic changes. My own prediction is that things will drastically change in the not too distant future, that the current path is unsustainable and the question is not if the economic system collapses, but when and what are we gonna do afterwards? And fortunately, other people have been thinking about this stuff so I urge you to check out some of the books that I've been reading. Um, of course, there's lots more research to be done. Um, I'm just dabbling in this, and I say I claim no expertise on it, but it's stuff that's come to me. Uh, it seems to be an urgent I issue that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so I'm gonna end it here and welcome any questions that anybody has.